Welcome to Producing for Radio. My name is Brinkley Messick. I'm a Columbia professor and a member of the faculty collective of the Center for Palestine Studies. This is what we call CPS, which was founded in 2010. The arts are crucial to the expression of Palestinian identity and experience in the world. And CPS is committed to the encouragement and presentation of the imaginative work of Palestinian artists, especially in film and theater. The center's um, theater programming, which is known as CPS Stage, was launched in 2012 and active through the years since and has seen campus presentations of a series of staged readings of Palestinian plays. Producing for radio, however, that is today's event, is the second installment in something new, the opening sessions in a more ambitious CPS stage project in a different but venerable genre of radio. And the, and the title we've given it is No Place La Macan. This project is also new in the exciting and much appreciated community that has come together around it. The talented Columbia committee that developed the original conception, Jeff Locke, Tom Casserly, George Vajalia, Kate Wilson, and Simon Rutkowitz, who's also the program manager for CPS, have been meeting and formulating this for about a year now. Uh, seed support for this new step uh, came from the Tides Foundation, for which we thank Peter Richards. We are most fortunate to be pr producing No Place La Macan in partnership with the A.M. Qatan Foundation, represented by Nasrin Nafa, Lamis Shalada, and Mahmoud Abu Hashash, with additional support from Ta'awun. We also appreciate support from the Hyman Center for the Humanities at Columbia University, with thanks to Eileen Gilouli. Not least in what is new for CPS stage is the fact that No Place, La Macan, has commissioned new plays for its inaugural season and has engaged artistic advisors. The commissioned playwrights are Khaula Ibrahim, Ismail Khalidi, Bashar Murkus, and Dalia Taha. All of these playwrights have now submitted second drafts of their new radio plays. Um, our artistic dress uh, advisors for this season uh, are Selma Dabar and Ahmed Masood, whom we heard from in a, a, a session called Writing for Radio last July, July 2021. Uh, a final distinctive feature of No Place La Macan is that the new radio plays will be translated and performed in both English and Arabic in both New York and Palestine. We have a translator Mutarjam with us to, for today's event, Mahara Awade, who uh, will, will provide interpretation. Uh, and so for this, please look for a, a button on the lower part of, on the lower right of your screen. On, which, which is labeled interpretation. And you will either pick English or Arabic, and then also uh, press mute original audio. Um, so I, I wanna introduce the uh, speakers for today, for radio, producing for radio speakers. We have uh, both uh, Paola Cosomelli Massina, a PhD candidate in ethnomusicology at Columbia University, and also Scott R.C. Uh, uh, Levy, Executive Director of, of the Green Box Arts Festival in Green Mountain Falls, Colorado. Uh, I want to turn it over now uh, to um, George, to George, to, uh, to Tom, who is going to be the, the uh, a moderator for today's uh, uh, session. He is a theater expert and a, a Columbia graduate student. So Tom, please. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome uh, to this panel. Uh, just a couple things about the way that we're going to go about this. You're going to hear from each uh, panelist, and then we're going to have plenty of time for questions um, after each of their presentations. So please, if you have questions about producing or about the Lemma Can project, feel free to drop them in the Q&A uh, bar at the bottom of your screen, and we will do our best to answer them. Um, so without further ado, uh, Scott, uh, you're up. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm here to talk about a radio play or audio play series because it, in the end, didn't appear on 
radio, but via podcasting, that we called Of Spacious Skies. And this project um, happened when I was the producing artistic director of the Fine Arts Center Theater Company located in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And I, I was in that position for 10 years. And, um, and as, as Brinkley mentioned, I'm now the executive director of Green Box Arts also in Colorado, and I've been here for a year, but back to Of Spacious Skies. So um, I have always had a love for radio plays as a child. I used to collect uh, recordings of radio dramas and comedies that were first presented in the 1930s and 1940s and always loved the work. Um, before I had a career as a producer of theater, I also taught theater at New York University and always did a radio play unit because of my love of the form. So we move forward to the beginnings of the COVID-19 pandemic and thinking about what kind of work the theater company in Colorado could actually produce. And I was not very attracted to doing theater in two dimensions on video screens like this one. I, we did some, but it wasn't my favorite. And so I had that idea of, oh, maybe now is really the chance where I can put this love of radio drama uh, and create something new. And so as a producer, the I, I sort of see the role as making it happen for all, all the steps, all together, getting the entire team. Um, in this particular case, it was the seed of my idea that I was looking to bloom. And, and so I made it happen. So how did I do that? I had to come up with the idea. And the idea was, let's create 12 separate episodes that would be released weekly over a three month period. That was the, that was the germ of the idea. Uh, then content wise, what I was interested was in exploring stories about the history of the place that I was in, specifically Southern Colorado, Colorado Springs. And then I realized that I wanted it to be more than just a voice. And so I decided to retain the services of a playwright who I knew to not necessarily write all of the scripts, but to lead a writer's room. And in the end, we had a total of seven writers who wrote individual episodes and then uh, sometimes paired up to co-write some of the episodes. So that was the next, well, I guess it wasn't the next step. From a producing standpoint, I had to actually create a budget for this whole project. And so I started to think about what was the maximum number of actors that I could afford to pay over this 12 episode arc. And I decided that we could have no more than six performers voicing characters in each episode. There could be 20 characters in an episode, but it could only be six actors dividing up all of those roles. So, uh, and then recognizing that we needed equipment. Uh, and of course, in the, in the pandemic, what I realized was that we would not be able to afford to provide individual actors computers, but that we needed to be able to provide them microphones. And so I needed to have a budget for uh, 12 microphones uh, that were all the same because I wanted the vocal quality to be consistent across the entire season when people were uh, in the end, some people were in California and some of the actors were in New York and most of them were in Colorado, but we had to ship microphones from place to place and then get them back. And then my theater production team, we decided to also make visual versions of these uh, radio play episodes. Um, so 
getting rights, of course, was not of issue, but we had to contract the writers uh, and, and pay them and recognize that we were going to cast all the episodes once they were written, which is why I was doing this in this stepped uh, weekly idea. So one script would be in draft form, another script would be in final draft form, then we'd get into casting, then we would get into rehearsal, and we rehearsed over Zoom and recorded over Zoom. And then the files, the audio files, were being recorded on each individual actor's computer and uploaded to our uh, a sound designer who was editing everything. So I'm going to show you a couple of images um, and, and tell some stories there. Uh, so the first image, and Tom's going to pull that up, I think, is of, uh, this is from the uh, first, oh, no, that's not the image. We're going to go back a couple of screens, I think, Tom slide one. And uh, this is an image of an actor who is recording in their home the first episode. And you, so you see Anna Fay is sitting in her chair. Uh, there is a microphone in front of her. Uh, and I'm going to imagine that the script is pulled up on her computer as well. And she's on Zoom with the other actors because I didn't want it to feel like it wasn't happening in real time. So the other actors, it's being performed in real time. And you'll see behind her is this mural uh, that has mountains and a building and a sky. Uh, and so we created six of those, knowing that there were only going to be up to six actors per episode. And then we delivered these murals to each actor for each episode so that in the visual versions we created, if we were using the actual actors' faces, their backgrounds would always be the same. And that was a design that our uh, theater company's scenic designer created that um, montage of famous places in the Colorado Springs area, along with the facade of the actual theater in Colorado Springs. So then we take all of this audio, and I would also say that I also commissioned musicians to write a theme song for the series so that there was that consistency from episode to episode. And then uh, the next picture shows you a screenshot of our sound designers, um, process. And this is, uh, uh, from the top, this is Beautiful, which was the name of the first episode in the series. And you can see that there are 30 tracks. And so each individual actor's sound file had to be split up so that it could fit into the greater whole. So when we were recording the episodes, we would have each of the actors press record on their computer at the same time and keep the recording going until the episode was over so that it was easier for the sound designer to cut and splice as it was. So as an example, I thought that I would let you listen to the little trailer we put together. And as you'll see on the screen here, we also created a visual version trailer. So first, I think Tom's just going to play the audio and you'll hear some clips, you'll hear me, and you'll hear some clips from the first two or three episodes because that's where we were before we were releasing them. And then we'll watch that audio accompanied with the visuals. So you'll see how it sort of worked together. All right, Tom. This fall, the Fine Arts Center Theater Company takes you on an adventure like none other. Oh, what? Come on. I'm coming. We can't miss this train. Of Spacious Skies, a 12-episode audio play series. Hello, hello to our amazing followers. Stories of our past, present, and dreamed of future. We are all here in the beautiful wild, wild west. Lived here all your life, or never been, 
Don't miss of spacious skies. Excuse me, where's the train to Colorado? Over there. It's about to leave. Hurry! For more information and to access audio and visual versions of each episode, visit fac.coloradocollege.edu. So I'll say that the, the audio, of course, in this Zoom environment is a little off, but I think you get the idea. And I will say that all of the Of Spacious Skies episodes still live on Spotify. Um, and we actually utilized uh, Anchor, a website called anchor.fm. That was sort of the way, it, that's who hosted the episodes. And we were actually able to monetize a little bit by running advertisements for Anchor in the middle of each episode. And every time somebody listened to the episode, we got a penny or two pennies. Um, you wanna show the, the visual version? This fall, the Fine Arts Center Theater Company takes you on an adventure like none other. Oh, boy. Come on, I'm coming. Here's Miss Of Spacious Skies, a 12 episode audio play series. Hello, hello to our amazing followers. Stories of our past, present, and dreamed of the future. We are all here in the beautiful wild, wild west. Whether you've lived here all your life or never been, don't miss Of Spacious Skies. Excuse me, where's the train to Colorado? Over there. It's about to leave. Hurry! For more information and to access audio and visual versions of each episode, visit fac.coloradocollege.edu. So in the end, we, uh, as of today, because I looked this morning, um, over 6,000 listens of the episodes have occurred. And it's interesting to see some episodes have, have had more listens than others. Um, and thousands of views of the visual versions on YouTube. And in the end, the last piece of the project was that we designed compact disc sets of all 12 episodes in the series. So it was a three CD set. And we were able to send those out as gifts to patrons of the theater company and all the artists that were involved. In the end, we had the writers, the actors, the musicians, the staff. It was about 100 people all together that participated in the series. And, um, and I'm, I'm so happy that we were able to do that and make that new work. And I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you so much for that, Scott. Um, that's fantastic to hear about uh, your process for putting together a um, a series that has actually a lot of similarities to the Lamacan project, which uh, we will um, talk about a little bit more uh, when we get into the questions. Um, but now we'd love to hear a little bit about the um, the actual kind of production. The you you alluded to the sound, um, you know, the sound designer's role and the editing. Um, we're going to hear about that process firsthand uh, with Paula. Thanks for joining us, Paula. Hi, thank you, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. Um, so yeah, as uh, Tom mentioned, I'm just going to provide kind of a brief dive into some of these processes that also Scott mentioned, so specifically recording, editing, and mixing. Um, as was mentioned, I'm a third year ethnomusicology PhD student here at Columbia, but I'm also uh, on the side and in the past years have worked extensively in audio engineering and sound design, specifically for podcasts, um, but also in film. And uh, in the past few years, I've worked with Status Alwada, which is a podcast kind of like audio visual magazine. So we have video content as well as sound um, audio content. And we work together with Jadalia.com and the Arab Studies Institute to put out content on uh, the, on Southwest Asia and North Africa from various different kind of like perspectives. And um, so that's kind of the work that, that I really like to do. And I love teaching about sound as well. So I guess like the starting point before we delve into recording sometimes is thinking about what types of sounds we're going to work with in the recording process. And this is kind of my own 
division of like some categories that that we can think of that might be useful so are you producing a more conversational style piece you know are you working with interviews or roundtable style discussions and perhaps using some music to uh, segue in and out of that conversation are you producing something more along the lines of a documentary style piece where you'll be you know stitching up together interviews with uh, field recordings so by field recordings I mean whereas an interview is in a confined space um, and you're not necessarily experiencing that movement sonically to other spaces. Um, it, perhaps in this documentary form, you're experiencing that shift. Um, there might be voiceover to guide you in that process. And there probably is music as well. And lastly, um, scripted narratives. But of course, I wanna also say that uh, hybridizations between these forms is possible. And that's what's so exciting about working with audio. Um, but scripted narratives, which I believe is more so where radio plays fall, um, not that there isn't an, uh, there can't be a possibility for improvisation, but perhaps here we have a stronger scripted uh, element, we have a narrative, so we have dialogue as opposed to an interview, right? And um, field recordings, meaning sound effects, so SFX stands for sound effects, and ambient sounds plus music. Um, I wanted to, at this point, then play an example of my work, and so we could hear kind of some of these elements in action. This is specifically a piece that I co-produced with a friend of mine here, Anabi, a few years ago uh, for BRIC, uh, an institution, an organization in Brooklyn, and they have a series of podcasts, and this one is called Brooklyn USA. So we produced part of an episode and we were specifically um, working with this inspiration from Rebecca Solnit's City of Women map. So uh, in one of her books, Rebecca Solnit reimagines the subway map of New York City um, and changes the names of the subway stops uh, to the names of women who made an impact in those regions of the city, either by working there or living there or organizing there. Um, so what Hira and I did was we wanted to kind of incorporate aspects of a sound walk where we would just walk this area with a microphone and talk to people about these women and ask them questions. Had they heard of this person and what was their kind of relationship to that person and awareness of that person? So I'm just going to play a small segment of that. Jordan. I think I heard a call before. Yeah, I read a book about her. It's like a history book. They were telling about, like, she's a black lady. Yeah, they were telling about some black history. She was our, like, uh, what she do for a living? She was an astronaut? She rode and she died. Okay, I think I read a book about her still. Tell me something. What do you think would happen if every time they kill a black boy, then we kill a cop. Every time they kill a black man, then we kill a cop. You think the accident rate would lower subsequently? So that is just a small segment I wanted. Um, so that, that last part was uh, our friend Mariah Hope Thomas re reading a part of June Jordan's poem about police violence. Um, and right after that, Hira comes in with a voiceover. And so you get a sense of all these uh, elements working together and um, the work that we're doing in recording, editing, and mixing is kind of bringing those elements together in a way that sounds good. And the recording is the first part of that. So what makes a recording good? I like to think of these four things. Um, so the intentionality of a microphone choice, they're all different. They each have different strengths and are used for different purposes. And the placement of that microphone, an awareness of unwanted sounds in your environment, uh, recording on Zoom you know, provides a very particular kind of challenge sometimes because we're recording in our homes. There's a refrigerator there's AC, there's you know, other people around this as well. So truly the closet is one of the best places to record. 
uh, one of the things we try to avoid as well are very reflexive kind of surfaces. So, you know, like very like wooden floors and stuff like that can reflect sound in a way that creates an echo. Um, and when we're trying to record different people in different spaces, they sound completely different. So sometimes even if you have the same microphone, um, which creates, which is great and like creates that evenness across sounds, um, going a step further and stepping, you know, asking actors to go into their closets and kind of like limit the amount of uh, the environment that they're also, also capturing with their microphone is important. Uh, third, levels. So by levels, I mean volume, kind of pretty much the same thing. So when you're recording something, your microphone is sensitive to sound and you can adjust that sensitivity in a few different ways. So making sure your sensitivity is not too high or too low um, to avoid what we call clipping. Uh, this is literally splitting the top, cutting the top of a sound wave off if you record too high. Um, and that's the resulting sound of that is this kind of abrasive, scratchy quality of sound that nobody wants and that costs actually a lot of money to, to, to repair in post-production. So we try to avoid these problems at the level, this first stage of the process, right? Recording is key. And lastly, uh, the quality of the audio recording. This is important especially to maintain a broadcast level standards when you're submitting your audio to be played on the radio or even on, on digital radio. Um, there is like a minimum level of uh, quality that is required. Um, typically, these are some of the things we always record in WAV format, never MP3. Um, it's a difference between uncompressed and compressed formats. Um, so in terms of microphones, I just wanted to you know, help visualize some of the examples, uh, some of the things that you might be working with. The, these, like for example, the lavalier the, is a, an example of an omnidirectional microphone, which captures sound all around it equally, uh, as you can see from the little GIF. Um, but we don't generally use that in podcasting. It's more so used on film sets. We have a bi-directional mic. So this is like a USB mic that plugs into your computer. And one of its settings is for it to be bi-directional, meaning it captures sound equally on both sides. Next, uh, a cardioid mic, which is best to capture uh, a voice. It really like um, provides a very, uh, gives a, um, captures a very warm quality, which, which is what we want uh, when we're trying to capture the voice for, for music, but podcasting as well um, and voiceovers. Um, and many microphones have this polar pattern. You can kind of just select that. Um, uh, it would be a condenser microphone specifically. And then there's also the super cardioid mic, which has a very sensitive area right on the front of the microphone. And these are great for picking up sound effects. If you go out into the field to get recordings for your background, right? What is that, you know, where is that dialogue going to sit um, in terms of the radio play? Though, um, you know, you never want that to kind of overpower the dialogue because that is key. Um, you can use this other microphone for that purpose. But usually, um, you know, as we saw in Scott's picture, the setup is sitting at one's desk, especially for capturing the dialogue. Um, and usually you want the microphone off the table. It's absorbent of all kinds of vibrations. So if it's on a table surface and you're, you have your hands on it, you have a piece of paper on it, it's going to capture those sounds as well as handling sounds. So if you're holding it and this contraption that's covering the front of the microphone is called a pop filter. It's also very useful for protecting the microphone, but also to minimize some of the more abrasive qualities of the voice. Um, there are a lot of irritating things about the human voice. We have sibilance and plosive sounds that if you're listening to something for a long time, can begin to kind of wear on the ear a little bit. So that reduces that. And you're usually, but not necessarily required to use an audio interface like this Roland piece of equipment here. Um, sometimes you can buy microphones that go straight into the computer, which is convenient, but they're not, uh, they don't 
get you don't get as good quality sound as if you're using uh, unless you're using a audio interface like this. So the microphone goes into the audio interface, and then the interface connects to your computer. Um, in terms of levels, as I mentioned, this is what you would be looking at in your software. Uh, Scott showed a screenshot of a digital audio workstation with, you know, this is, we're reaching now the editing and mixing processes where the audio is being imported into this workstation and separated into tracks. So here we see, you know, a host on one track with other dialogue on other tracks. Um, and the purpose of having that separation is to be able to treat each piece of audio differently. We're applying filters where, um, you know, as Scott mentioned, uh, trimming clips and moving them along on the timeline um, and manipulating them separately is very important. And also here uh, on the digital audio workstation, you can look at your levels. So making sure that you're never surpassing zero in decibels. That's where we mark where the clipping happens, where the audio wave gets kind of permanently damaged. So um, in terms of like these last two processes really quick, I'm kind of going through all of this really quick so we can get to questions, um, but just really wanting to, to show you a little bit of recording and then editing. It's a process where you're using headphones. Usually one person does this job. Um, of sitting down with all this audio, cleaning it up, which is applying filters, as I mentioned, um, which each have a different task and a different function, but also cutting um, and adding sound effects and music, um, and then mixing this all together um, is a key stage as well and separate from editing, because at this point we're listening to the overall picture. We're not treating the tracks separately anymore. And we wanna make sure that all these elements, the dialogue, the sound effects, the music and the background are working together and not against each other. Things, uh, sound can get muddled sometimes. Um, and you, in, in this mixing process, we're helping the listener focus in on certain aspects of the sound, you know, depending on what our, our intention is, you know, but with, with the radio play, you know, the dialogue is key but um, there are different, um, the sound effects and the background and the music can also play an important role in, in, in the process. But yeah, I think that this is what I prepared for today. I hope they're, you know, I'm very happy and excited to answer some questions about any of these processes. So thank you. Awesome, thanks so much, Paula. Um, I think we'll move to the, Q and A portion of the uh, of the event. Um, I think I'd just love to start things off um, talking about the word producer, right? So in it's it's a term that has a lot of different meanings. Um, as you know, Scott mentioned, it's uh, you know making it happen, right? Is is part of being a producer. A, a lot of what you're talking about as well, Paola, falls into the category of making it happen, but it's in the, a very specific lens because in a way you are physically producing the audio that comes out that the listening listener is listening to. Um, so we know there are a lot of different kind of hats that a producer might wear, um, but I'm, I'm interested in uh, maybe what you think about the intersection between the creative responsibilities of the producer and the technical or the organizational responsibilities of the producer, given that it seems like there are elements of, of both and how do they interact, how do you keep them different, and kind of how do you not go crazy um, trying to use both sides of your brain at the same time. Um, so maybe Scott, if you wanted to start, uh, start with that. Well, I loved seeing that presentation because that I was like, yep, yep, at, like all of that and everything that you said is so much a part of that producing. And it, it made me remember part of our process when we got into the technical piece and me going, you know, there if it feels at this moment, there's like a half a second of uh, dead air, of, of silence. Let's trim that out like wanting to keep the flow going. So I think that to some degree, the connection is 
as the producer, I'm really thinking always about the end product and how the, in this case, how the listener is going to experience it for the first time and want to stay engaged. So that, you know, it, it, sometimes it veers into roles and responsibilities of a director as well. And, and to be fair, in our audio play series, I directed about half of the episodes. And it was very important to me that I directed the first two episodes so that there was like a, 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 a consistency in what everybody else was doing. And I sort of equate that to, in a lot of ways, how TV series are run, right? The, the creator of the TV series, who is often the producer, often writes and directs the first episode. And then there's sort of that show running that happens. Um, yeah, I, I think that, does that answer that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. And then from the kind of sound perspective as well, Paola, like obviously um, you're making decisions that impact the creative uh, product, but you're also making decisions that are very much steeped in, you know, your knowledge of the craft um, itself from a technical perspective. So kind of how do you balance those things? Yeah, I think like, especially working on this piece for Brick, I mean, there are many different like I've had so many different experiences where like this yeah this role of producer towards the more technical side or the more creative side or like I'm constantly kind of fluctuating between them um, depending on the project I'm working on and you know it's nice to be situated firmly in one sometimes because you're very much focused on that aspect but I think having knowledge of producing um, in these two different ways is is has been pretty key for me because like you mentioned they're they're related you know they're connected having an idea of you know when you're before you're even recording of what you're going to need what types of sounds you're going to need and you know being able to talk to, to to actors and the people you're going to interview um and guiding them through that process as well i think is important i i I think, you know, I love this idea of, of access um, to audio and like working with it in a way that um, in a sense that you can do it at home and like not be daunted by it as well is very important to me. So I think having like wearing this, these many producer hats is hard sometimes to juggle everything. And then, you know, sometimes I just want a moment of being comf like being able to focus on one thing sometimes is very <laughs> comforting. So I then I'll just sit down in one of those positions. But I think having that that yeah vision is is so so helpful. I I also just want to add in, of course, the producer's role in relation to the financial resources, mm -hmm. um, because it's of course terribly important. So that idea about we have to figure out what resources we have or there or need to get based on the budget that we set to make the product happen. And in the case of the, the theater company where this project came from, it's a nonprofit organization. So I'm, I was never looking for people to invest money into the project that they would then hopefully see a financial return on. I was taking resources from donations and grants that we received and other in-kind services in order to make the budget then turn into the reality of the project. And just building off that, I totally agree with what Paolo was saying, where sometimes, and so I work as a producer in theater and, and other aspects. And sometimes it's just such a relief to, uh, to be responsible for the execution of the project and not necessarily have to deal with the financial aspects other than let's be as efficient as possible and spend the money in the way that the values of the organization or the producer, you know, in, in those ways. But, you know, sometimes kind of putting your head down and just doing the technical job is as satisfying as kind of grappling with the um, you know, confluence of producing and producing, you know. Um, but I think, Paula, you were talking about um, accessibility, and we have a couple questions about uh, that, that kind of go along with that. I mean, now 
anyone can pick up their phone uh, and record a podcast um, or use, you know, use their, their laptop or um, use Zoom to, you know, put something out there. Um, a couple technical questions. Uh, what programs would you suggest for uh, local audio capture so that you're not taking the audio for directly from Zoom, you're running it through one of the programs that we saw um, in, in both of your presentations and kind of following from that, what's what might be an audio solution that you could use um, with an iPhone rather than with a uh, laptop? Yeah, so an alternative, I mean, to Zoom, I guess, um, yeah, the Zoom quality audio that you capture, you know, when you're recording the audio off of Zoom is, is really terrible also because it results in that kind of compressed audio format. Um, so really the, the ideal setup uh, would be to have an audio interface like the one that I that I had in the slides. Um, and you know the, the actors, if we're talking about actors and a radio play, could be interfacing over Zoom, like you know, like Scott mentioned for his project, um, to be able to see each other, right? Um, which is so important. Um, so that can still happen, but at the same time, we have, the audio going through the interface and being recorded on the computer um, at each of these different, each actor has that set up. So, and then all those audio files would then go to the producer. They would not go through Zoom at all. Um, and then they would be put together in post-production in the software that, that you know, I showed a screenshot of was Pro Tools specifically. Um, so I'm not sure if this question is also asking about software, um, but there are many options. Pro Tools is kind of an industry standard, especially for music, but is often used also in podcasting and film. Um, but Apple, if you have an Apple computer, Logic um, is a good option. GarageBand is more for music, so I would not go that route. It's kind of hard to work with. Um, but one uh, free piece of software that's always been out there. It's called Audacity. You can download it for free. It's kind of got an old school vibe to it in terms of like the interface aesthetic, but it's super useful. I have it on my computer and I always suggest, you know, if you want to start, um, you know, getting your hands on audio, that is a great piece of software to turn to. And the other question was... I just want to add in for our specific project, we had actors record to either Audacity or GarageBand based on what system was on their computer, because in both of those instances, those recorded files could be saved as MP3s or in the format that the audio engineer wanted. And then the actors would upload those saved audio files into a Google Drive. So that's how the rest of the team could access those files and listen back to them. Um, and then the next question was about uh, attaching to an iPhone or you know, if you don't have a laptop uh, and that, that those programs handy. Yeah, there are a bunch of um, microphones that you can buy now, like very high-end microphones made by Rode uh, that you can attach via the lightning entry on your on your iPhone, for example, if you have an iPhone, um, so that you can get better quality audio using your iPhone. The microphones now on, on iPhones are not bad, um, but definitely if you are able to uh, purchase one of those attached attachment microphones, those are actually very good quality and kind of compared to the microphones that we use with computers even. Awesome. Um, so this takes us back a little bit to kind of thinking about radio plays as uh, as a specific kind of art form. So George is asking, um, what advice or suggestions would you have for actors and directors and even producers who are more used to uh, performance on stage um, rather than uh, on radio or in an audio medium. How would actors need to think about acting differently for audio, um, like physically speaking into a microphone rather than projecting into a room, um, you know, versus the actual kind of like what, 
what types of aesthetics are you thinking about given that visual, which is one of the things that we rely on most in theater is, is not necessarily there. Um, so maybe Scott, if you want to start with that one. Yeah, I'd say that that it's a great question in it and it's throughout the entire process. So of course, I'd say it starts with the writing, right? And um, it, it's interesting to what in radio plays, I think the the words or the sentences that appear on the written page that you that's you can't rely on that. You actually need to, uh, as the director or producer, read the sentences out loud, because you don't want to you want to try to avoid unless you're trying to do it on purpose, tongue twisting, and having too many of similar syllables together. Frankly, um, I also think that. Uh, the way we listen to words is different than if we have visuals to go with it. So uh, this is really like a, a very oversimplified way to say it, but in audio plays, I think the less words, the better. That you can get a point across in a five word phrase as opposed to a three sentence arc. And that keeps the flow going. So then when we get to the performers, and this is, uh, it was very important to me that when actors were auditioning for me, I had every single actor, no matter their gender, no matter their age, audition with the same one minute piece of, it was a, it was a monologue from a one person play in which the actor was representing six different characters over that minute. And that's what I wanted to hear was how they changed their vocal quality from character to character. And when I did the auditions over Zoom, I had the actors turn their camera off when they were doing the audition. So I was not focusing on any of this physicality and it was exclusively about the sound. Uh, in the performance part of it, I'd say one of the big differences, I don't know that it's so much about, you know, like keep keep yourself this far away from the microphone is often a good uh, a, a way. I'm just talking to you, I think naturally, I'm not speaking to you in, in, in an elevated stage voice. And I think that's the way to think about it. But a lot of actors love to breathe. And in making a radio play, make the breaths as short as possible. Very oversimplified advice, but. But very, very helpful. And uh, um, Paula, do you have any other kind of tips and tricks for people who are trying to produce the best sound that they can? Yeah, I was just thinking about, it's such a great question. I think, you know, the the microphone, I think I becoming comfortable with it being there and becoming aware of like, of of how it works and like, how the sound changes depending on you know how you're speaking or where you are in relationship to it is so important so i think you know i'm i'm not an actor but like this kind of you know you want to focus on the people that you're interacting with as well in the scene and on your lines but i think you know if there's room for also for this consideration of your relationship to the microphone you know there's this you're kind of yeah, it's it's not, I don't think it involves, you know, tailoring your performance or changing your performance in some major way, but just acknowledging that this piece of equipment is here and that, you know, you have there's an intentionality that you have to have, I think. Um, and I think rehearsing, uh, there's another element to rehearsals then, you know, which is let's rehearse for the microphone and like see what different sound, different approaches to the microphone sound like as well. I think that's, that would be important. I'll also add in for the actor and because, you know, as we were doing the recording, as I noted, we had the entire acting company on Zoom. And so all the actors were wearing headphones so that they could hear the other actors, but so it wasn't picked up by the microphone. But in turn, I would say in this particular environment, it seemed to work best when the actor had one headphone ear on and the other off, because then it felt like the actor was able to be more connected to their own voice. 
And, and that's what you would expect to see when you see like Mariah Carey recording something or or whatever. It's like so that they can hear the real quality of their voice in the room, but also be getting all of the information uh, like the background music and, and all of that that they might need. We also tried to avoid when we were doing test recordings or rehearsal recordings, we didn't really want the actors to go back and listen to themselves because as you know, uh, every individual's voice sounds different to themselves than it does to everybody else. So we didn't want the actors to get too self-conscious about the way they sounded. That makes sense. Um, so I think with the last couple minutes, I'd love to um, just talk a little bit about our what we're actually trying to do with this uh, project, which um, Dr. Messick uh, referred to at the beginning of uh, in the introduction. So, with this uh, Lamacan project, we are we have commissioned uh, plays from uh, four Palestinian playwrights, and uh, we're in the process of going through all of the things that Scott that you talked about from kind of conception all the way to production. And uh, one of the reasons why we had this seminar now is because we're about to shift into that production phase. We've received drafts of the plays from the playwrights. Uh, we're in the process of um, translating them. And then it's going to be all about getting the actors together, the director, um, and getting them, everyone in a room uh, to start, start creating the piece um, over radio. Um, one of the things that I would love to hear from you, Scott, given that you went through kind of a similar process is, was there anything that you learned, I think, throughout that process um, <laughs> that we can extract from you, you know? <laughs> um, but anything that you learned that, you know, if you were to go do this again, um, that you might wanna change the structure or kind of keep in mind, um, really at any point in the process, but particularly kind of where we are. Boy, I, you know, it, uh, I love the whole process of, of a project and, uh, and I only wish that we could do it again, actually do a, do yeah. a whole other season or series. Um, I'll say this, I think that um, one step that we might have left out potentially was hearing the play out loud, almost like a table read, even without the actors that were going to perform it well in advance as a timing device. Because I, it was very important to me that each of these episodes was less than 25 minutes. I, I had that number in my head. And it would have saved time potentially in the very, we did about a week of rehearsal and then three days of recording for each episode. So it would have saved some time in rehearsal and potentially in rewriting if we had known, oh, you know what, let's cut these three pages now uh, because it's just elongating the time. Um, yeah, I, that, that's what comes to mind. It's actually great to hear because I think one of the things we're thinking about is putting together a table reading so, so that all of the different stakeholders can hear the pieces for the first time to just kind of be aware of them, especially as we're partnering with the Catan Foundation in you know, Ramallah and having them be able to hear what we've been working on for the last few months right. at, a, at a certain point in the process, but also for the playwrights to have a chance to just hear it once. And then even if they're recording three or four weeks later, um, that's going to inform both the sound needs and the playwriting needs and um, all of that stuff. So, And I think that's terribly important in this particular medium when all, all we're talking about is the audio quality because the playwrights may go, the idea of that dialogue is right, but it doesn't sound right. I need to find different words for it to sound right. I'll also say when you get to the final product, and I don't know if you're thinking about a limit on time for each of the four episodes, I'll call them, but imagine that there's opening and closing credits, and that takes a certain amount of time. Uh, so if that's part of the full package, then the, the meat inside the sandwich, which is the play itself, needs to be even potentially a little shorter. Yep, that makes sense. And I think we're um, thinking along similar lines in that it's, it's very difficult unless it's kind of serialized, I think, for someone to pay attention to a two hour or three hour, um, you know, piece, uh, just because that's not what we're, or we're not really trained to do that. And that was not how the classic, the golden age of radio, I'll call it from the 1930s and 40s. I mean, they were 
half hour at most, most often 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And uh, we actually did some studies that showed that the attention span of people listening to audio plays right now, the average is seven minutes. Wow. Well, I think that actually leads us into our closing, given that we are just reaching an hour and I'm sure people's uh, attention spans are <laughs> waning as we speak. Um, but uh, I wanted to thank both of you for participating in this. I think it was both really helpful for how we're going to continue to do the project and also helpful as a resource for anyone who's looking to put an audio project out there into the world um, to see that it's absolutely feasible uh, even on maybe not the biggest of budgets, uh, and and it's but it's something that has a lot of um, tips and things to to kind of keep in mind as as you do it. So uh, thank you so much, Paula and Scott, and thank you everyone for uh, joining us. Um, and if you have any questions about the program or anything, feel free to reach out. Um, Simone will put the um, contact information in the chat. So uh, if you want to hear more about the project or you know have any specific questions, feel free to hit us up. Um, thanks so much, everyone, and uh, have a good rest of your afternoon or evening if you are not on the East Coast. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.